Hello and welcome to section 3 of chapter 38 on the stormy 60s for the uh, American pageant. Today we're going to look at the struggle of civil rights through the Kennedy, killing of Kennedy. So we're looking really at civil rights in the Kennedy administration during the early 1960s. As previously mentioned, during his campaign, I mean, Kennedy did some work. He actually helped get Martin Luther King Jr. out of jail in 1960 uh, during a sit-in. Uh, he had campaigned that he was going to, you know, help African Americans. And so he largely gained the black vote by saying he would pass civil rights legislation. Fast forward to 1963 and nothing had been proposed, nothing had been done. Uh, he was slow to pass legislation or even propose it because of fear of not getting support for the new frontier. Uh, he didn't want to support, lose support from his co-Democrats, his fellow Democrats in the South, uh, by angering them and stigmatizing them uh, through a civil rights bill. Uh, some other things were still going on, though. You have the sit-in movement, which started in 1960, and then you have the Freedom Riders, the Congress of Racial Equality, which is core, an older civil rights group, but did some stuff all the way back in the 1940s, rode two buses from D.C. to New Orleans in May 1961. And you're probably thinking, well, that's not a big, big deal. Uh, it was illegal for African Americans to ride across state lines on a bus. Absurd. It was just me meant to demean... Uh, African-American citizens and make them feel unworthy and like second-class citizens. Uh, the leader of this is James Farmer. Uh, it went smoothly. I mean, they had a lot of fun. They're going through Virginia and then Tennessee. Uh, those are called the Upper South. And then they reach the Deep South, which is Alabama. Uh, there, the Whites stoned and beat the Freedom Riders when they got off to, to get refreshments and, uh, you know, take care of nature's business. <coughs> Excuse me. This was all on television, which embarrassed Kennedy. Uh, he was in Austria at the time negotiating peace treaties, and so he called, notified his brother uh, to do something. So Robert Kennedy ordered them to stop and said, you guys need to cool off. Uh, his personal representative was actually beaten unconscious because of this. Uh, James Farmer, in reaction to this, said, we've been cooling off for 350 years. If we cool off anymore, we'll be in a deep freeze. Uh, more and more buses kept coming through the summer. This is a picture from Anniston, Alabama, uh, where they set fire to the bus uh, as they exited um, to show their disgust of what was going on. So the Freedom Riders pressed on. There's more violence in Alabama. Uh, federal troops were finally sent in to try to protect them, uh, which led eventually to a partnership between John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. by sending in those federal troops. Uh, Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. got a better relationship. Uh, which is going to come into fruition with the Civil Rights Bill, which we'll talk about here shortly. Um, there was, the, the whole federal government was not supportive of Martin Luther King Jr. There was uh, suspicion in the FBI specifically uh, that Martin Luther King Jr. was a communist. They tapped his phone, they tried to dig up dirt on him. J. Edgar Hoover called him the most dang dangerous Negro in the United States. Um, that's his term, not mine. Uh, and so he, they really did a lot of bad things, you know, releasing information that demeaned his character. Uh, and the FBI was really against Martin Luther King Jr. because he was supposedly a communist. Um, in Jackson, Mississippi, when the Freedom Riders got off um, and tried to use all-white facilities, they were simply arrested. They weren't beaten. They weren't had, didn't have their bus set on fire. They were simply arrested for trespassing, for trying to use white-only facilities. That whole summer, Freedom Riders kept coming and kept coming, and bus, ass, bus, bus load after bus load, to the point where the Federal Interstate Commerce Commission finally banned segregation on interstate buses, which is a lot of work. I mean, we're talking months and months of people riding on buses, being attacked, being arrested, all for the right to ride a bus across state lines. Uh, in schools, so we had Brown versus the Board of Education. 1954, and then you had Brown versus the Board 2, which said that they could do it with deliberate speed, and then you have the Little Rock 9. Um, integrating universities and other schools was a different matter. Uh, a couple instances, uh, in 1957, 15-year-old Dorothy Counts here in Charlotte, North Carolina, tried to integrate a high school in Charlotte. Uh, as she walked to school, she was pelted with sticks, uh, with pebbles, uh, and it was too much for her. Uh, she showed great courage, but couldn't handle all the negativity. And her, she and her family actually moved and went to school in Baltimore. Excuse me, Philadelphia. Uh, and so this is a picture of her. And uh, the person behind them is trying to make her look like the devil with their fingers. Um, and this was an instance where you, you read about or you hear about a lot of success stories. This one did not work. Uh, and she was forced to move, went to Philadelphia. 
However, Charlotte, North Carolina today is one of the most integrated places in the United States. Their schools are very integrated and they're very proud uh, of learning from their mistakes. The most, I don't know, heart-wrenching story I think is uh, six-year-old Ruby Bridges. A six-year-old little girl uh, wanted to go to school in New Orleans, Louisiana in 1960. Uh, there was two days of riots. Uh, all the white kids were pulled from her school, from her class, and sent to private schools. And so little Dor uh, Ruby Bridges went to class by herself. Uh, she and a teacher from the north um, taught her one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the teacher took a break and ate by herself, but Ruby refused to eat because one of the white protesters said that they would poison her food. Uh, and so the white teacher began eating with her and then began, you know, this was just, this is, when you see pictures of this little girl, it's just astounding that anyone would be upset over this. Um, she was taught alone by a white teacher from Massachusetts. She went the whole year without classmates. The next year, things were pretty much normal. This is Ruby Bridges here. Uh, this is her with armed uh, escorts not, or escorts taking her to school. Uh, and this is a very famous Norman Rockwell painting of her going to class with protection. Um, you can see that there's a tomato split on the wall and very faintly there is the n-word painted uh, to symbolize what she was called. Uh, today, this is Ruby Bridges here looking at the painting of herself with President Obama. The one thing about the civil rights movement is whether you uh, agree with it or not, I hope you do. Uh, but if you agree with President Obama or not, is what I was trying to say, he was evident that the civil rights movement worked. The fact that we could have a man named Barack Hussein Obama II as our president showed that the civil rights movement was worthwhile and had success. In 1962, federal court ruled that James Meredith could attend the University of Mississippi. Uh, he was a veteran. He was going to attend on the GI Bill. Uh, Governor Ross Barnett prevented him from registering. There were riots uh, for a black man going to Ole Miss, as it was called. Uh, Ole Miss, their mascot, was the Rebels. Uh, in this riots, in these riots, there was two killed. Uh, and for his entire nearly two years of, of college, he was escorted from class to class by armed guard. At the University of Alabama, uh, George Wallace symbolically stood in the doorway to block African Americans. Uh, JFK sent the National Guard. Uh, Wallace stepped aside and allowed African Americans to attend to attend University of Alabama. Wallace backed down. You probably maybe recognize this. This scene was depicted in the movie Forrest Gump. This is the old logo for Ole Miss the Rebels. Doesn't get any more southern and white than that. Um, the Voter Education Project started in 1963 to register African Americans to vote. Uh, they knew that social equality and economic equality would not would be a difficult goal to attain without having political equality. So they really wanted the effort to register African Americans to vote. And then you have Birmingham. In 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. targeted the city. Uh, he failed in Albany, Georgia. They had this big plan for protests, for marches in 1962, nonviolent, and the police simply let them march. There was no incidents, there was no violence, the media didn't cover it, and so they didn't really have any goals, they didn't really have a, a focus or an aim, and so it largely failed. So Dr. King, a man of nonviolence, knew that to have action, to have a reaction from the government and the public, there needed to be violence. Not on their part. And so they decided to target Martin, uh, Birmingham because it was arguably the most segregated city in America. Uh, the... The head of the public safety, who was the head of the police and the city council and fire departments, Bull Connor, was one of the most racist uh, people in the South. In fact, there was a federal court order that said that the parks of Birmingham needed to be integrated. Uh, he closed all the parks to whites and blacks. Birmingham was nicknamed Bombingham from a series of unsolved bombings in which African Americans were targeted and killed. Uh, and so they used children. And so this was Project C for confrontation under Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, the, police, the police arrested thousands, including kids. They brought school kids, ages 6 to 17, 18 years old, and they protested. They marched peacefully through the business district of Birmingham. Bull Connor arrested thousands. They filled the jails. Then they unleashed fire hoses and attack dogs on these kids. Dr. King himself spent two weeks in jail, which in most literature classes, you probably have read letters from a Birmingham jail. This is where it came from. Uh, TV carried images of the police using fire hoses, attack dogs on the demonstrators, and this really shocked the American public. It shocked the North, and it shocked President Kennedy of how bad things were. 
that this violence was so appalling so, that, that these kids were being attacked in the streets. And so it, it kind of changed the minds of many of Americans, including President Kennedy. Uh, John F. Kennedy sent 3,000 troops to restore peace. It also to contribute to the realization that the violence was going too far. Medgar Evers, uh, one of the head of the NAACP, was brutally murdered in Alabama uh, in June. This is Bull Connor. You can never quit these boys if you don't keep doing them separate. I found that out in Clinton. You've got to keep the white and the black separate. Nice guy. Bull Connor here. Uh, here's the attack of an African American by the attack dogs using fire hoses on kids. This was shocking, and it led to finally President Kennedy introducing a civil rights bill to Congress. Uh, a sweeping change to the national law to ban Jim Crow, to ban segregation. Uh, in support of it, African Americans, 200,000 African Americans and whites, marched on Washington to voice their approval for the passage of the civil rights bill. Uh, this occurred on August 28, 1963. Uh, they sang We Shall Overcome, but it's been immortalized because of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. I'm going to let you listen to briefly part of it. You probably heard it. If you have a chance, you probably need to check out the whole thing. We'll skip to the part where you probably are famous. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its dream. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created. I have a dream that one day on the Red Hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners, will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the people's injustice, Sweltering with the heat of oppression, be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Get to the closing of it. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring and when they happen. When we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all the soft children die. Men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Uh, that portion of the speech was actually not planned by Dr. King. Um, I wouldn't say it was ad-libbed. He had done that, that sermon or that speech many times in churches across the South. Uh, but he wasn't initially was not going to do that portion. But then members of the crowd urged him, said, tell him about your dream. Tell him about the dream. And so he just kind of went off the cuff, uh, went off his speech and gave the most memorable part of it. So the Civil Rights Bill stalled. It didn't have a lot of support, uh, especially out of the South. And so President Kennedy went to the South to gain support. He went to Texas, to Dallas, to try to get people to support the Civil Rights Bill that was being hung up in Congress. Uh, President, Vice President Johnson was also from the South, and so this was kind of a, a big deal for Kennedy to go there. On November 22, 1963, Lee Harvey Oswald uh, shot President Kennedy dead and wounded G uh, Governor Connolly. Uh, here is Governor Connolly here. Uh, Lyndon Johnson was sworn in uh, aboard Air Force One before it took off to go back to D.C., carrying the body of John F. Kennedy 
back to Washington. Oswald was killed two days later on live television by a, a nightclub owner named Jack Ruby. Uh, they were transferring him jails, and Jack Ruby heard it on the radio and just happened to stop his car and grab his gun out of his glove compartment and went in and shot Oswald in the, in the abdomen on live television. He left his dog in the car. Uh, because of this, people thought there were conspiracies. And there's a lot of them out there. Don't believe them. They're, they're all been disproven. The magic bullet, the second gunman, you name it. Uh, the Warren Commission, headed by Chief Justice Earl Warren, found that Oswald and Oswald acted alone. Um, this is one of the most tragic uh, days in American history. This is the original Zapruder film. The only known footage of the Kennedy assassination. I'm going to show it once. Uh, if you don't like this, you might just skip ahead. It is graphic. This version tracks the limousine and maintains President Kennedy and Governor Connolly at center frame. This version is only in slow motion. There's three shots fired. The first shot misses. The second shot, the magic bullet hits President Kennedy in the back, comes out of his throat, uh, wounds Governor Connolly in the ribs, uh, shatters his wrist and is embedded in his thigh. The third shot is the death blow, a headshot to President Kennedy uh, in Dealey Plaza. This was a Friday, shocking events in the United States history. Here's the assassination of Lee Harvey Oswald on television. Lyndon Johnson being sworn in as president of board Air Force One. Uh, first time that a female, a woman, swore in the president of the United States. This is Dealey Plaza. Some people think it was an impossible shot. This is the Texas uh, Book Depository building, and the arrow's pointing to where Oswald shot. Uh, this is where the X's are on the, uh, the pavement where the bullet struck. It's not as far as it seems. It's not a very far shot. Um, very tragic end to President Kennedy's life. We're going to stop there. If you have any questions, let me know.